Good day. This is Robert Balfans, the director of the Everyone Graduate Center and a research professor at the Center for Safe and Healthy Schools, Johns Hopkins University School of Education. As more and more schools close for longer periods of time in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's important for us to start considering how we can keep all students, and in particular secondary students, connected to school when schooling is remote. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about why school connectedness is important and how we can keep kids connected to school when they're not in a school building anymore. What is school connectedness and why is it important, especially for adolescents? School connectedness is really based on research that's been done by Bob Blum and others at the School of Public Health Johns Hopkins and other universities. And they were looking at ways to understand what is it that makes a student feel that they're a part of a school community and what are the benefits to students of feeling like they are part of a school community. So based on their work at others, school, con school connectedness has been defined as believing that you are welcome, wanted, and cared about and needed in your school. It's about knowing that you are known, able to find peers with similar interests, outlooks, and experiences, and able to help others and feel that school policies are fair, supportive, and just. In simple terms, school connectedness is what a school is a place you want to be. Why is it important to be connected to school? Well, the evidence is clear that feeling connected to school is vital to adolescent health, well-being, and educational achievement. Kids that are connected to school have less mental health and physical health, health challenges. They use drugs and alcohol less, and there's fewer teenage pregnancies. As importantly, they have better grades, they graduate at higher rates, and they enroll in college more often. What makes a student feel connected to school? Students who feel connected to school, first and foremost, have an adult in the school who they believe knows about them and cares about them as a person, as an individual. Someone that will notice when they're not there, someone that talks to them about their life, what's happening, what they want to do, who they want to become. Students who feel connected to school also have a group of peers they interact with and feel an affinity with. This can be a sports team, it can be a theater crew, it can be a club, it can be an identity group, or it could just be a circle of friends. But it's a sense that you have kids like you, however you define like you, that you can find and interact and be with and support each other in school and out. Students who feel connected to school are also engaged in activities helping others. Um, and this is an interesting one, right, that you might not suspect because oftentimes we feel that, uh, you know, adolescents are very self, <laughs> self-directed, self-focused. Uh, but the evidence is clear that students feel connected to school when they feel that being in school helps them help others. This might be directly through tutoring or participating in food banks or, or various drives to collect money or uh, uh, needed supplies for folks or indirectly by being involved in environmental or social justice or other types of social change efforts. And finally, students who feel connected to school believe school is a welcoming place, a place they want to be, a place that has a positive and supportive climate. What is the potential impact of COVID-19 on school connectedness then? Well, when schooling becomes remote, especially suddenly, has been, as has been the recent case, school connectedness is definitely at risk. Students are cut off from the face-to-face -face contact and the minor daily interactions that build this sense of connectedness. And initially, adult focus, often rightfully so, is going to be elsewhere. For example, how to deliver instruction remotely or how to continue providing lunches to students who need them. Some other challenges we're gonna face, right, is that teachers and administrators and counselors are gonna to need to teach their students and also support their families, who in many cases are in sheltering at home with them as well. And this is just gonna naturally reduce the amount of energy, focus, and time they have available for things beyond those most immediate things like supporting school connectedness. As a result, there's a real danger if we don't consider this deeply and understand its importance and work to find a way to find time to engage and build kids' school connectedness when schooling is remote, that it could become an out-of-sight, out-of-mind problem. If we're not seeing the kids face-to-face 
on a daily basis, it's harder for us to get a sense that they're disconnecting from school, that they're fading out, that they're struggling from that lack of community, that lack of purpose, that lack of believing somebody believes in them. So if we can't see them, we might not think it's a problem given all we have to face. But what we really want us to consider here is the evidence is clear, school connectedness matters, and we have to find a way to keep it going even when um, we can't see it. So that leads us with the big question, right? So it's an important problem, but what can we do about it? What could, what could school staff, parents, and communities do to build school connectedness when schooling is remote during COVID-19? Well, first we gotta get the logistics in place, right? To maintain those connections. We need to make sure we spend the time to check is the phone number on record for each student up to date? Can we actually, can we actually get a, face, a, a phone conversation and talk to each student? Um, is it possible if they don't have them to provide students with a school email address? Some students may have computers but not have an email address. Without that, how do we communicate with them? And really we have to think through how can students be contacted with? Can it be by phone, text, email, social media, computer? Different districts have different regulations, many put in place for very important reasons to protect students. Um, but we have to rethink those in the current environment and figure out what are safe and effective ways that we can be in contact with our students and through what means and medium um, is both appropriate for us to use and is also available for them to have. And we'll have to do some thinking there, maybe some compromising and really make sure we're balancing safety with the need to stay connected. Um, and if it's not known how to contact a student, is there a friend who, who who would know, right? We have to think this through. Just because we get stuck one way, what's another way? Who might know how to contact the student that we do know how to contact if we don't? All right, once we have the logistics in place, the goal is to find ways to build and maintain the four drivers of school connectedness. That students feel known and cared for as a person by a school staff member or a person who works in the school. That students interact with other students with shared interests and or affiliations. That students engage in activities they believe help other people and that students believe their school, even when remote and virtual, is a welcoming place. That's what we're after, to try to figure out how to make that happen. All right, let's take these one at a time. So how do we help students feel that someone from the school knows and cares about them as a person when we can't see them and talk to them face to face? Well, first it's important to maintain existing ties, right? Let's find ways to keep our club and sports team structures intact even if it's just a means for coaches and club leaders to check in on students. If chess team meets every Friday at four, every Friday at four, let's try to have a chess team check in. If the soccer team and the baseball team and the tennis team, whatever team would be playing right now, let's have a way still just to check in and, and, and a way to communicate how we're doing and find things to do together as a team. Not every student is going to have these built-in ties or going to be part of a built-in team or club structure. So we're going to really have to think about asking teachers and school staff to reach out to students who they know, who they have that connection with already, and provide some tie in the workday for this. We have to see building and maintaining student connections as part of teachers' work and make sure that as we're asking them to do remote instruction and other tasks, that we've built some of the time into their workday to actually connect with their students. Not every student is gonna, as we said, is gonna have these established clubs or groups or even a teacher already in place who knows and cares about them as a person. So we're gonna have to you know, go grade by grade, making sure that we don't have kids left behind, left alone uh, to disconnect and be unsupported. So using Google Docs or other digital tools, you can have teachers in each grade can identify who students who may not have these connections um, and then try to identify an adult to reach out to them, right? We just have to go through, use our knowledge or pool our knowledge of everyone that might know that student to see who may or may not have those connections and those that don't, how can we find someone to, to build that outreach? And one good way that research has shown to create new possibilities for connections is to have both students and teachers share hobbies or interests. And in this case, we can make it hobbies and interests that they're engaging in from their homes. And then once you find that commonality, I like knitting, the student likes knitting. I do crossword puzzles, the student does puzzles. Whatever it is, you find the thing to connect on by having a shared hobby, there's good evidence that helps build a place to connect and build those relationships. 
All right, how do we get students to interact with other students with shared interests or affiliations when they're not face-to-face? -face? Well, again, we wanna maintain those existing student group structures, sports teams, student governments, model UN, debate, drama, 4-H, robotics, LGBTQ groups and other affinity groups. Have the club advisor engage the students in figuring out how to maintain student group activities remotely. And again, I know initially people may see that this is, this is not as important as instruction and there's only so many hours in the day, but the case we're making, the evidence is clear, is we want students to be able to focus on that instruction and complete that instruction remotely, they're gonna to have to feel and maintain and continue a connection to school. And keeping those connections going by keeping kids connected to their peers and to their teachers will actually make that instruction be more effective. So this is important to engage in um, as we go to build and continue schooling remotely. And then again, we're gonna to have to create new affinity groups or student partnerships that are linked to activities that can be done remotely. So many of these multiplayer game and environmental building and construction um, environments are well suited for that. Again, we can't imagine, we can't leave it to every student to be able to self-organize. That will leave some students out. We have to take, you know, create some structures, some environments where we can bring people together to sort of, again, find these shared interests and create teams, create a team structure, create tournaments, things to keep them engaged at the school level. Um, there's many, is you know, this is only limited by our imagination. Um, there are old fashioned radio plays, for example, that were designed to be done by people on the radio that could be done um, with people in remote locations, each sort of, you know, talking on the phone, on a speaker phone, they could actually conduct a radio play. There's ways to think about public speaking contests where people are, you know, doing point counterpoint and videotaping it and then having presentations of those. There's things like team puzzle tournaments. It can be all kinds of levels and uh, dimensions of, of engagement are possible to think of um, that create new ways to create affinity groups and partnerships um, that can be done remotely. How do we keep students engaged in activities that help others? Well, there could be a lot of win-win here, right? Because there's a lot of a lot of folks need a lot of help right now. Um, and if, if helping others helps students stay connected to school, we really gotta figure out how to channel that. So some you know pretty obvious ones are to set up peer coursework and homework hotlines. Ask students what subjects and age children they feel comfortable helping and have an adult from the school organize groups of tutors on their grade and subject and connect student to student uh, to help them. There's a lot of evidence, again, when kids are learning remotely and in sort of a digital environment, that many kids benefit from being able to do that with somebody else, not just on their own, to sort of learn together. Um, and that can be done with a, an older peer um, student um, who can engage together. And they're not there to actually be the instructor, but they're there to help them work through the material that's being presented digitally. Um, and so, you know, kids could be on, the, on a video connection together as they're watching a video on TV and working their way through it. Um, we should ask students directly, what are some activities that, 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 that they think of that could help the others that could be accomplished by many individual efforts? So what is the modern equivalent here of quilting, quilting bees and, and sort of knitting squares, right? Where folks would, every folks would create their square and then ultimately the squares would be put together to create a big quilt. Um, that's still a good activity, but there's other activities that are gonna be like that, where many individual pieces uh, that could be done at home can add up to a collective whole. And we should actually challenge students to be the ones to think through and try to come up with what, what's relevant for them. And we can also have students use social media platforms to collectively promote social actions relevant to their community. And then finally, how do we make school a welcoming place when we're not all together? And is that even still something to be concerned about? Most certainly it is. Students still gonna have this idea that I'm going to school, I'm part of a school, I'm missing parts of my school, um, even as they are each own individually in their own, own homes. So we really have to try to anticipate and then address concerns students might have about how remote schooling might impact activities and outcomes they care about. Um, and again, this is where we really should start asking them to really understand what it is they're most concerned about and most nervous about most frustrated about, create some forms. Maybe there's a way to have, again, grade level, or if there's an advisory structure, build upon that. Or if there isn't, build an advisory structure where you know 10 kids from a certain grade can get together with an adult and sort of talk through what's going on, the challenges they're facing. Information can be shared in through those venues um, of you know resources that are available. And also we can get ideas from them about how to change 
what we're doing uh, to make it more effective. So really think about how to create those structures, sort of remote advisory structures, if you will, um, that enable small groups of students to get together with an adult on a regular basis to share information both ways and have a dialogue about how things are going. Um, and then, you know, find alternative ways to conduct or experience those imp important school activities, right? We just gotta, we can't just have it be canceled. We have to find a way the best we can to have some sort of version interactive um, over a phone or over video or in some way so that students don't feel a total loss that many things they were counting on and looking forward to and are really formative parts of forming their identity are just gone in a, in a sense that no one cares about that. Um, they really have to make us show that the school cares. And the last thing I want to say is that in all of this work, and there's building school connectedness when kids, when schooling is remote, that the mindset we need to build amongst ourselves to do this is really the sense of acting with empathy, practicing self-care, and this idea to bring attention to an important needs, even if they may not seem like immediate concerns. And what, what I mean by this is everyone is under stress, feeling isolated and uncertain about the future. And we know under conditions of stress and scarcity, this is you know one of the great examples of stress and scarcity we're facing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, that humans focus on immediate needs, for example, instruction or providing lunch, and can set aside acting on things that remain important to longer term success, like school connectedness. And then when the crisis passes, those things that were important but put aside come back to cause real problems because now we have a whole group of sort of lost, potentially lost opportunity youth who became disconnected from schooling because they didn't feel that anyone noticed, anyone cared, anyone was able to outreach, that they were able to maintain peer connections and adult connections and, and feel important making a contribution. All that was lost, leading to a sense of hopelessness. And many of those kids, you know, may not come back the next year. So we really have to work together to push through our natural tendency under these conditions to sort of put issues like school connectedness aside, even though they are important. So we really have to help our students through these times. We need to make sure we maintain the energy and focus and hope to do both, to meet those immediate needs of instruction and food and so forth, but also meet those important needs <laughs> that still exist and don't go away um, as we're reacting to the crisis. So in closing, I really want us all to keep thinking of ways um, using our best imaginations and with empathy and self-care and attention to what's important, making sure all students, especially the most vulnerable, remain connected to school, even when schooling is remote, because it's important. It affects their life, their life course. It will actually make the instruction go better. And when we are able to get through this crisis and come back, it will keep everybody more intact and together as a community and enable us to move forward all that more quickly. Uh, I thank you uh, for participating today or listening today or joining us today. Um, and uh, I hope everyone is well and stays well and that we're able to keep working together to keep our kids connected and educated and supported um, so they will all be successful. We will leave you with some resources and some references um, to learn more about school connectedness and different ways to think about it and even ways to think about it once we get back to school and being in schools to make it even stronger. Um, in the return. And so I thank you uh, and wish everybody uh, a good day and to be well and to stay well. Thank you.